Okay, there's a lot going on in crypto right now. As a matter of fact, there's a lot going on around the world right now that can affect markets and crypto and stocks and everything. And it can be overwhelming. I mean, you got China legalizing mining again while also creating massive stimulus. You got the elections in the States, you got October, you got the four year cycle, which may extend to a longer cycle or shorter cycle. And we're gonna be talking about that in just one second. You have regulations, you have wars in crypto right now and so much more. So what I did, I bought Kevin Merko of Coin Metro, a fully licensed and regulated crypto exchange. He's also the board members and various boards around Europe. When it comes to finance, when it comes to macro, when it comes to economics, this is the person to talk to. This is the person to listen to. And we're going to be talking about China, we're going to be talking about the US, we're going to be talking about crypto, we're going to cover a lot of stuff, we're going to bring you a lot of alpha, so go inside, grab your favorite beverage, get some coffee, whatever you need, a notepad, a pen, sit and relax and make sure you pay attention to this video, because we are starting right now. Hey guys, I'm Bertha Fans. Remember, Paul is not a financial advisor but he is good looking. Also, this is not financial advice. Please subscribe down below and check out my channel at Brief It Things. So Kevin, we are in an interesting time right now with everything going on with Bitcoin. We broke 60K, we look like we're going up. China is not just about to unban Bitcoin mining allegedly, but also they're taking measures for their economy with quantitative easing, different other measures. How do you see it going? Where do you see the markets going? Is this beneficial or should I say, how is this beneficial for Bitcoin and other sectors? Thanks, Paul. So let's see, let's take it from the top. So China, everybody knows, anybody that's been in crypto longer than a minute knows China has played a big role ever since, let's say, the first bull run, literally. Uh, why? Well, back in the day, people wanted to move money out of China. China stops people from moving over 50K out of China. They have a lot of rules that mm. stop people from moving funds. Bitcoin was a way around that. Then Tether after that. But anyway, so Bitcoin was, was the way out. Uh, then notoriously, they didn't like Bitcoin, they liked Bitcoin, they didn't like Bitcoin, they didn't like Bitcoin, you know, they kind of went back and forth. Now, still 55% of all mining sits in China. Now, you can speculate that that might be just small miners, meaning people in their homes, uh, or you can speculate that that's mostly the government. I Which would say is that, why they wanted to stop it in the first place. Correct. I would say that the spec if you're speculating somewhere in the middle, meaning some of that's households and some of that is the government, you'd probably be accurate. Now, they have AML rules coming out that specifically mention cryptocurrency. Why would they do that if they thought that their ban was working? And if they know their ban isn't working and they have to protect so-called money laundering, then more than likely they're leaning towards unbanning. Mm. Uh, but what they want to make sure is, one, that they're on par with, say, the rest of the world in terms of policing Bitcoin. Uh, and that's what they're doing now. So I would say, all in all, that's bullish. Not to mention we have kind of a perfect storm of the four-year cycle is ready to kick off literally tomorrow or yeah. whatever in October, right? So we're, we're getting, we're, we're there basically. Uh, you have U.S. elections. You have a very tumultuous U.S. election. You have speculation that a Republican is going to win the White House. Uh, all those things together mean well, mean bullish, or all bullish, I guess, at the end of the day for crypto. Every single one of those things. Do um, China is also the second biggest economy in the world, and when they start printing money that actually significantly impacts the rest of the world. Um, and they're not just printing money. They're, they're, doing, they're giving money for stock buybacks. They're doing a whole bunch of stuff. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and how could that affect a Bitcoin, not just as a high-risk investment at this point, maybe also as a hedge with everything going on, because this could actually lead to drama as well. And maybe we want to talk about that as well. Absolutely. So at, at the end of the day, any stimulus right, in any country, whether it be China, whether it be the US, whether it be in Europe, stimulus usually ends up invested in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Now, you mentioned high risk with Bitcoin, right? So definitely the last bull market, definitely the bull market before that, definitely. So we're talking four, eight, 12 years ago, 16 years ago, throughout almost that entire time, Bitcoin and crypto at large was considered very high risk. However, with the now we have ETFs with Bitcoin, we have ETFs with ETH, we have a completely different look 
BlackRock has publicly said, you know, well, obviously they have an ETF, but they've publicly come out and talked, you know, pretty decent about Bitcoin, right? They're not, they're not bad mouthing as they were. They're not saying it's a gamble. They're not saying it's a Ponzi scheme, which they absolutely did in the past, by the oh, way. Yeah. Um, and so that all that really means is volatility at some point, maybe not this cycle. I don't think it's going to happen this cycle, but in cycles to come, volatility is going to start to die out because massive amounts of institutional money will flow into Bitcoin. Now, when you come with stimulus, yes, people generally invest stimulus some way, shape, or form. Now, in high risk assets, mm, a little bit of stimulus usually goes in high risk, you know, 5%, 2%, 1%. But considering that Bitcoin may be, may be not high risk on most people's portfolio or the highest risk as it was four, eight, 12 years ago, I think a good amount, a large amount of money, let's say even a, even a quarter of stimulus money could make its way indirectly or directly into the crypto markets, whether that's through, you know, going on an exchange and buying Bitcoin or whether that's getting exposure to mining companies, whether that's getting exposure to companies that have tokenized themselves in one way, shape or form. You know, this market still isn't probably the size that you would call it, you know, a behemoth in terms of markets around the world. But it is poised to pick up a ton of capital. Mm. Uh, this in this in this bull market that we're all expecting start October into maybe 2026, um, and then you know for years and years and years to come. What about the um, not the theory? That's not the right word. But if a large country like China does stimulus, wouldn't other countries have to follow to balance it out? Can't that make an effect where other countries also have to print, um, raising the chances or the or or, or the um, the Ooh, chances is a good enough word <laughs> of, of U.S. also stimulating and so on. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, the probability, I think you were, you were searching for that probability. Probability. Um, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, <laughs> central banks have two buttons, you know, and that, and well, they have, a, they have, they have, they have two different buttons on three different dashboards, right? So basically when it comes, they're either printing or not printing and they're raising or lowering interest rates. Mm -hmm. Then the other two buttons are like run out of the room or duck and cover. I mean, those those are the those are the six buttons. And so when it comes to, yeah, when large economies start to change from, let's say, higher to lower interest rates, when they push stimulus, when they go from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening, et cetera, it does put pressure on other currencies around the world. Now, the the I guess the unique thing about China is that their currency is very much manipulated by the internal government. Mm. Uh, and so it has a little bit less effect on the global economy, but where it does really sting is imports and exports. Mm. Uh, so, so China is a massive exporter. We all know that, uh, but they're also a massive importer. Uh, and so they're definitely a bigger exporter than importer, but they're still, a, a, they, they do both, right? They're on both sides of the economy. But when it comes to export, everybody in the world buys stuff from China. And so if that stimulus starts to move uh, the the exchange rate or prices simply start to go up or down based on you know inflation, that affects the rest of the world. Either they're buying more or they're buying less from China, um, or they're in, they're, they're import, you know they're ex exporting more to China or importing more. So that can definitely lead because China is such a big economy. That can definitely lead to comp to, to other countries having to make changes in their own fiscal policy. I think China knows like I guess everybody else, but China knew at some point, probably in the last three to six months, that the U.S. was going to start cutting interest rates. Mm. And the U.S. being their biggest trading partner, they want to jump the gun a little bit here. U.S. already went down by half a basis point. They know that probably we're going to see three, four, five more cuts of similar size. And they want to jump in front of that bullet because the U.S. being their biggest, I guess, customer, you could call it, uh, they, want to, they definitely want to make sure that they're still able to profit and, and, and see, you know, large amounts of money inflowing into China. So, so I guess it's maybe inverse to what you mentioned, but absolutely, when, when any big country starts to do anything, every other bit major country, G7, G20, whatever, is, you know, eyes on the price. And definitely US and China are, well, they get the most eyes because they're the two biggest economies in the world. Now, I had, I had a theory, um, I was actually talking about this last year, that there would be, um, right now, the U.S. is cutting interest rates. And after, historically, most of the time, not every single time, but historically, every time they raised rates aggressively, then cut them, it led into a recession. 
if we have a little bit of a thought process here, okay, let's have a little brainstorm. Right now we're having elections. There are two bipolar governments. One is pro-crypto, one is anti-crypto. It doesn't matter how much they say they're pro-crypto, they're not. Or at least it won't be pro-crypto, or at least not the way they think it is. <laughs> um, if you take the rates cutting the rates cutting and maybe the election results into play. Could this lead to a recession or shorter bull market? Let's have a look at the bearish look here, the bearish side of things, because you have to look at all sides always. Sure. What do you think? So, uh, you know, I would say that the U.S. economy in general was in recession for some time, even though it wasn't public, publicized, I should say, that the U.S. economy was in recession. You know, the funny thing about an election year is obviously when you're the incumbent, when you're the party that controls, you don't want bad news coming out. You want to get reelected. Exactly. But you absolutely want a bad news to come out about your opponent. Right. So you also want to try and position anything you can to potentially harm your opponent once they take office. Right. So you're right. In many times in the past, there's been when there's been rapid interest rate deductions after, you know, years and years of high interest rates. 80s is the 1980s is a good uh, marker that, that, that you can check. Uh, the interest rates hit, I think, 15, 16 percent uh, in the 80s. And there was a rapid reduction, which led to the 90s recession. Right. Um, and so, yes, that that's definitely possible, though. That usually takes some time. It's kind of like, you know, it's like your grandma's, you know, if you're if you're Italian, it's your grandma's pasta sauce. If you're, I don't know, Russian, it's your six, huh? six months, eight months after election, if this happens. Well, generally speaking, so let's assume both 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 potential options. You have uh, the Democrat uh, uh, Kamala Harris winning the office. That's going to be bad for markets almost initially. You're going to get a, you're going to get a knee jerk reaction that yeah. will be negative. You probably will see prices generally return to where they were relatively quickly, but you will have stagnation for at least several months while people try and figure out what exactly the policies are going to look like and Congress. whether or not they should be investing. Right. So that's, you know, other news can propel the market as well, like further rate cuts, et cetera. Right. With a Republican winning office or Donald Trump in this case. It will shoot up too fast. It, it's going to shoot up. It's going to be a knee jerk reaction to the upside. There'll definitely be profit taking. Now, with the advent of ETFs, the, the difference here is what used to happen in crypto is that Bitcoin profits would be taken and pumped into alts. Yes. Um, but, you know, if your grandfather bought three Bitcoin through a BlackRock ETF and he gets his profit, it's going to go to his Bank of America account. Right. He's not going to buy, you know, Dogecoin with it. Very true. Um, and so that can affect, I guess, the swiftness of the cycle. It could even extend the cycle. So we don't have a four year cycle. Maybe we have a six year cycle now, maybe. Or, you know, there's there's many different things. It could also shorten it. Right. So just like you said, it could be a shorter bull market. But then that could also lead to an almost non-existent bear market, meaning the bear market is really just a correction like we would see right, right. in stocks or, 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 or any other, let's say, traditional market. You know, my my money is on uh, probably the Republican winning the White House, and for for no other reason than markets like certainty. Yes, exactly. And while they might not like Donald Trump per se, they have no idea what a Kamala Harris, uh, you know, four year term is going to look like. No idea, zero. They kind of have an idea Neither what Trump Kamala. Term. Yeah, they they kind of know what a Trump term is going to look like. They saw it already, and it was good for them. You know, the guy the guys with money during the Trump last Trump term did well. And so, yeah, they're not going to be too worried about that. So I, I do think we're going to see a, a Republican victory. With a Republican victory, I would expect, yeah, for between three and six months of kind of just a heightened craze around get my money in the market. Yeah. And that coincides with the normal, you know, normally we see Q4 into Q1, bullish, Q2, Q3, stagnation, Q4, Q1, 2026, super bullish. And then normally there's a cliff. Yeah. Now, the question is the cliff. Because again, if Bitcoin is less volatile, even if the rest of the market is super volatile, we more than likely won't see such a cliff, meaning you won't see such a stinging bear market after a bull market. That's that's anyway, that's that's what it looks like right now, at least in my crystal. Very point. interesting. And yeah, and, and when I used to, when I when I was in my shorter bull market thesis, the truth is um, I actually anticipated Bitcoin going up faster. Pre having, I had no idea it would reach, reach all time highs. I just thought it would happen faster. Um, but then we had that long consolidation to the downside where I said, okay, we're back to 50 50 now. I don't know. 
<laughs> whilst before I was like almost certain we might have, or there was a chance we'd have a short the bull market. Now we're back to, I don't know. There's too many variables, too many things going on at the same time. Now you mentioned something extremely interesting, Kevin. You, you, you mentioned something about altcoins may not being the same or coming in later in the market. And we're already see, we have already seen kind of a glimpse like that of that. But you being the CEO of a major exchange, Coin Metro, um, you see inflows, you see what's going on. I'm sure you have friends that also have exchanges. <laughs> um, do you see people coming into altcoins or what do you see going on? And, and do you see an alt season eventually coming or are we going to have mini alt seasons uh, if that's what we can call them, which we've seen up to now? So if I fast forward really into the future, say five years, 10 years in the future, I think altcoin markets are going to mimic something like pink sheets, penny stocks right. look like, uh, and, and just your broader equities markets, meaning that you will have baskets that do well. And we, we, we started to see that already, right? Early this year, we had the AI basket exactly. do extremely well. For what reason? No reason. Um, but, you know, people, generally speaking, when, when a narrative goes out in the public, and the thing about crypto versus, say, the stock market, unless you're talking about meme stocks, is that crypto is a young man's game. Mm. And- the young guys are all on social media, they're on Telegram, they're on Discord, and they communicate fast. And so markets can move just as fast. You don't, you know, you don't see, you know, your grandfather or your great uncle Tom sitting on, you know, I don't know, Discord talking about GE stock, right? right? That doesn't happen. And that's why the markets are the way they are. But what it shows is where the, the, the power in community, because when community came to the stock market, we had meme stocks. Right. We had stocks move quicker than, you, we, than the market has ever seen simply because there was some guy talking on Discord and sounded like he knew what he was talking about, right? So, so with, with that, now if, we, now if we move back to where we are now, yeah. we are starting, you know, with the advent of ETFs and more and more institutional money. We've talked literally years ago about institutional money removing volatility from the market. And that's what's going to happen. Why? Because the more money that flows in, you have more experts that are buying and selling. You're not getting peaks and troughs like you do with retail money because if something goes up 20, 30%, an ex expert takes profit. Whereas, you know, you or me might sit on our hands and go, oh, this is going to go up another 10x. I'm going to wait. You know, they don't do that, right? Mm. They're, they're, taking, they're taking profits and they're doing it in a systematic way. And they're also going to take losses in a systematic way. That reduces volatility. Now, you can, if you go to a Bitcoin conference, let's say you know, it wasn't Bitcoin Miami this year. It was, I don't know, Bitcoin Tennessee or something. Um, but, you know, Bitcoin Amsterdam just happened, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Everybody in there says, you know, we're not in here. We're not in here for the money. It's all about it's either the tech or it's, you know, what? Of course. Nonsense. <laughs> well, uh, but, yeah, of course it's nonsense. But, you know, because if Bitcoin was three cents, there wouldn't be a Bitcoin. There, there wouldn't, wouldn't be a Bitcoin, a Bitcoin Miami. Today. There wouldn't be yeah. a Bitcoin. Like if, there, if the conference ticket was 10,000 Bitcoin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. be, there'd be a pizza party. Yeah, yeah. So, but but the point is, is that the you know all these all these all these retail guys and all this retail flow are there because of volatility. Because you still have the ability to double, triple, quadruple your money with Bitcoin, yeah. right? When that becomes ten percent a year, fifteen percent mm -hmm. a year, twenty percent a year, fifty, forty percent in a good year, most retail money, the vast majority, is gone, and it needs somewhere to go. And that adrenaline that that that, that they're looking for when they invest is going to be an altcoin. So we, what I think we will see is we're going to see a transition from Bitcoin dominance will, will probably not change that much in terms of the broader crypto market. It's always going to be a big piece of the crypto yeah. markets. Eventually, though, they may separate them. It might be Bitcoin will be commodity market then and everything else. will be everything else, right? But you know, you're going to see dominance. However, as Bitcoin starts to slow in terms of its volatility, the people that are looking for the big gains won't even touch Bitcoin. They will be jumping in and out of micro caps to, to mid caps to right. small caps to whatever back and forth. And we will kind of something else will take Bitcoin's place in kind of the currency of the bull market. So, you know, historically, you go into Bitcoin, make money, put it into alts, take that money, put it back into Bitcoin. Bitcoin shoots up final hurrah. You take that set of profit, goes into altcoins, boom. And then you get your capitulation. So there's going to be another asset that takes that place. That's probably a few years away, you know, and I do think these four year cycles will end. I think this might be the last traditional four year cycle that yeah. we've seen. Um, I don't know what they're going to look like, to be honest. They could be shorter. They could be longer. They, they may be very much what, like you said, well, you'll have pockets and it's going to be much more based on fundamentals. Yeah. 
And so rather than, oh my God, it's October, let me buy crypto because it's going to go up. Because that's what, what that's where we are right now. Pretty much, pretty much. That's where we are right now. Everybody's like, oh, oh, it's October, you know. Get, let me let me let me get out my, you know, let me get out my calculator and do a couple thousand X's and see what right, that looks like. Right. Yeah, go that's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I see the same thing happening. Um Although I do think that it will, there will always be opportunity. Like if they, they may not be a four year cycle, but there'll be a sort of four year cycle, maybe with meme coins, maybe with other narratives, maybe with trend stacking. I mean, I, I was talking about AI previous bull market for this bull market and, it, and that came out and then um, trend stacking principles, it had to be gaming with AI. I mean, there's gonna always be something, but it but we have to be in front and see so so hi history rhymes. Let I, I try not to find what's going to be the same. I try to find what's going to be different. And, and it's hard, but it's a lot easier than trying to find, <laughs> you know, what's going to be the same thing. Let me ask you something about regulations now, because I know you're an expert in this. And we do have a lot of regulations coming up in Europe. For those of us or you that live in Europe, things are changing. A lot of people are leaving Europe at least uh, virtually, um, if not in person, maybe with an offshore company or something. My question is this, there's something coming out, I can't remember the name of it, in 2026, it's already passed, and it has to do with credit exchanges, I can't remember where it is exactly, but everyone has to report to your, this, your government in your country any crypto assets that you get or exchange. So if I have a crypto debit card and I've been spending, I don't know how much money till now, when that law comes out, I don't know if it's from thereafter or if the before is counted as well, but that uh, that credit card or that debit card will have to report to the government, your government that you are in or where you're a citizen of, uh, exactly what you've been doing or do. Um, can you tell us more about that and what's coming? Sure. So there's a there's a lot of things coming. So what you're talking about is is essentially just automatic sharing of, between tax authorities across the EU, right? The exact acronym escapes yeah, me. Right? I, I, I you're right. It's January first, 2026. There's also DARPA, which is more focused on the tech rather than the monetary side. And DARPA is already in force across some uh, some portions of the EU, and in some countries it won't take effect for another 6, 12, that or 18 months. That has to do years. with AI, I think? So it has to do with crypto, AI, blockchain, well, blockchain, let's say, the, 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 what underpins crypto, and also AI, and any, of, any other real, let's call it, uh, innovative technologies. Um, but it's, it's, it, it is the first time we're seeing any type of really collective regulation on the EU level, really, almost anywhere in the world. Uh, based just on technology, right. which is a bit scary, to be honest, uh, but it is what it is. Then you have MICA, which is Markets right. and Crypto MICA. Assets, which is uh, the big one that's, again, already officially kind of started, but most EU countries are giving either till sometime in 2025 or sometime in 2026. For example, Estonia has pushed the deadline out to June 2026 uh, for already regulated entities. But those so so when it comes to the the, the tax in general and, and, and tax reporting, you know, I guess this was there's, we all should have seen this coming, of course. given the fact that it's it's like this for any other asset class. Now, well, when I say it's like this, the laws are in place. Does that mean that every single transaction you do is automatically reported and the, your tax authority sees it and then is ready to audit you? No, not necessarily. Mm. Um, and so now that I'm not telling everybody not to, you know, pay your tax, make sure you pay your taxes, pay the amount you're supposed to pay, you know, don't try any tricks, don't pull any tricks up your sleeve. Right. But in reality, a lot of automated tax sharing is kind of like a good analogy would be if you've ever seen like a cartoon from the 80s or 90s, picture that guy that's sitting in his office and he's like, somebody comes and brings him one notebook full of shit. <laughs> he sees it. And then there he grabs him. He's like, oh, this is it. So he goes through it. An hour later, he's done. And then someone comes in with three more, 10 more, 15 more, 100 more, 1,000 right, more. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So it's automated, but not necessarily usable information. Um, but if the tax authority wants that information, like they want to audit you, or they believe you may or may not be filing correctly, they have the information. Mm. So the, 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 the idea for the, the crypto regulation is that all exchanges 
will have to automatically share basically name, date of birth, uh, tax, tax ID number, places where the, where the person has said that they, they are supposed to file taxes. So they're, they're kind of, yeah. they, they, they themselves have said, okay, I, I file here, here, and here, um, along with all their transaction information. Um, and I believe it's done, I think either monthly or quarterly, or it might even be, it might even be in real time. I think it's monthly or quarterly, I think is what they settled on. Um, and that's probably gonna change as well as we get closer to, to kind of launch. Now, these are um, European exchanges or exchanges that have a license in Europe, even if they're abroad. Well, so you, so well, if you have a license in Europe, you'd be considered a European exactly. exchange. So, so, so definitely license. European exchanges because they can enforce the law with European exchanges. However, I believe the wording of the law basically is if you have clients in Europe, you're, you should be providing this information. Mm. But the authority doesn't really have the authority to be able to force an entity that isn't licensed and or domiciled in the EU to follow the rule. Mm. But that doesn't mean they might not go after and try to enforce it. So if there's a very large exchange that's not doing it and they and they believe that they're not getting the information they should, they definitely would potentially could attempt uh, to go ahead and try and enforce it. But definitely for any exchange domiciled and or licensed in Europe, it's going to apply and they will be it will be enforceable. When this happens, will um, and, and I like the way you say that it, it will probably require a certain threshold for somebody to actually audit and go out. They're not going to audit everyone simultaneously in your, your European Union unless everything's AI. It will take a lot of years, right? So it, at, at least how I, I think things work, right? It takes it takes a lot more. It's, it's not that doable. Yeah, you, you need you need to do something normally to be on the radar. Right. Now, so. if somebody has a debit card, because I know there's a lot of people like this, that have debit cards, whether it's Binance, whether it's crypto.com, whether it's whatever card there is out there, that, and, and we're talking about physical, physical cards, because if it's a virtual card, they, you, you probably, don't, you probably not, don't, don't have to go through KYC, at least not as much as you do for the, for, the, for the card that you need for the ATM, whatever. The question is, if somebody's been using one of these cards and the law comes in, is it from when the law comes in and after, or will they backtrace and see? So does it make sense if somebody spent a few million dollars with a card to close that account and get a new one? <laughs> if that so, makes sense. And, and, well, so this is not tax advice. It's but not I tax advice. I, I, I'm, and, and, it do, and it doesn't mean that, and, and we, we, we're not implying anybody to do this, but a lot of people are sweating in their sleep right now. So... Um, so I'll give you an analogy real quick and without saying names, but so we all know of an exchange where just recently the CEO was and then just got out of prison. Right. Yeah? Now, one of the reasons for that really short sentence, I can almost guarantee you, is that the U.S. government now owns all the right. transaction and KYC information that sits in that exchange. Right. Now, very similar to this question about debit cards, et cetera. Uh, now, whether you give KYC or not on a virtual or even a physical debit card, the amount of information that's shared every time you use it um, is quite substantial. Mm. Uh, that can be IP, that can be that can be device that you're using it from. They get a device ID, um, ge you know, geographic location, time, etc. Um, all those things, if they really wanted to, would give them enough information to potentially figure out who was using that card. Okay. Now, in order to do all this, it costs money and takes time. And so, again, you know, if you're if there's no reason for them to be looking at you. They probably won't. Mm. As far as as far as like kind of being grandfathered, you know, grandfathered in when there's a law and before that they don't care, after that they do. They're definitely going to care afterwards. That's for sure. Most of the time, though, yeah, previous transactions related to anything prior to a new law generally uh, aren't necessarily looked at. But that new law very well may give them the ability uh, to go and request without a judicial warrant any information that's relevant to an investigation. So, mm. yeah, so if you make one transaction on January 2nd and it flags something somewhere, you know, I don't know, you, you bought like, you know, some, you know, of course not illegal, but some Obviously. some not illegal product on the dark web um, and somebody well, wants to- You didn't to pay taxes it. for it. You don't, you don't have the funds to show that you made that money and you didn't do taxes on it. I don't think anybody here is doing anything illegal, illegally illegal. I hope not. Uh, we're talking about tax evasion here. Yeah. So, so which is, which is pretty, I mean, it's I mean, pretty I mean, huge. Uh, uh, but yes. Yeah, so so the but 
I guess what I would say is, is that and closing an account is not going to make any difference. Right. Um, because the information's already been spent, let's say. It's there. Um, again, I guess using the same card could give you a, a higher kind of flag, you know, potentially a warning to, uh, to an authority um, in, that, in that instance. So, yeah, maybe maybe you'd want to open a new account. But at the end of the day, that, that information isn't going anywhere. No, it's, even, it's there forever. Yeah, even an institution that doesn't follow all the laws, so to speak, that they should be, normally will hold your financial information for at least seven to 10 years after you close an account. Uh, and they do that, they do that, well, one, because of the reg- the laws or the regulation, but, but they also do that to protect themselves. Mm. Um, so, yeah. And so you can expect a lot of fines in Europe, basically, because I think that's what it means. If, I mean, if you spend 200,000 and you haven't shown a way that you made 200,000 didn't pay tax on that, you're basically looking at a fine. Uh, well, oh, yeah, or a tax audit uh, and a fine and, uh, you know. The worst, and that tax audit is going to find that you made a lot more than you probably made. And then you're going to have to, for this. So the way tax authorities generally work is if they're going to audit you, not in every country, but in many countries, uh, you know, they'll say they see you made 200,000 on this debit card, for example. Like, well, we think you made 4 million. Ooh, OK. Yeah, now, but- well, you, now you have to prove you didn't, which means you're going to show your actual transaction, you know, because you're going to have to give them information to disprove their ridiculous theory. And that usually leads to you paying what you should have paid, you know, in the beginning, plus fines, plus whatever. So, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so, 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 so basically it depends where in the bull run you are. Do you, does it make sense to pay the fine or to hold Bitcoin for a while longer in three or four X so you can pay everything? Yeah, yeah. Easy, easy, easiest way to do this is, man, every, every time you make a transaction, especially when you would draw money, just put 30% in, a, in an account. Put it in an interest-bearing account. Mm. But at the end of the year, or 20% or whatever your tax bracket is, 8%, 5%, try to make sure that it's paid as dividends. Try not to get paid as uh, as earnings. Make sure you're structured. You know, if 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 you are spending 200000 on a debit card, spend fifteen k with someone that knows how to structure uh, wealth and, you know, and, and, and get them to do it right and pay 5% and pay Very it legal. Good advice. I think everyone and should. And don't worry about it because – because the longer you go without doing what you're supposed to do, the probability they're going to catch you is going yeah, to increase. Of course, of course. And once they do, they're going to they're going to make up imaginary numbers. If it's been ten years since you you know five, they're going to make up. They're going to say for ten years you made you know more money than 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 anybody's ever heard of, um, and you don't want to be in that position. So you know, spend a bit of money, get yourself structured. Um, it's going to be the best investment you made, especially if you end up making money during a bull run. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. Of course. I, it's everyone needs to mature. And like in the beginning, like when we first started crypto, things were different. Um, I mean, as far as we knew, there wasn't any taxes involved. But now things are changing. Things are maturing. And I think we need to mature with it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely there were loopholes abound initially because. Well, basically, the authorities were saying, well, this isn't money. We don't want to regulate it. We don't care. Exactly. It's going to go away. It's a, it's a fraud. It's a scam, whatever. And so, yeah, if they don't want to recognize it, then how do you pay tax on it? You know, they, exactly. they, they, you they can't. There, somebody I know somebody in a European country that actually um, declared that they made money with crypto. They declared they paid capital gains. They bought a house with it. And then they got fined the full amount because if we don't recognize this as money. We don't recognize. I mean, well, why did I pay it then? I, like, and and you're forced not to pay. And there's yeah. going to be a lot of these cases because it's it's uh, it's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but, but now you know, at least in kind of the G7, you know, when we talk about U.S., U.K., Europe at large, you pay tax on your gains. I mean, that's and and that that's it. There's no real question anymore. So you don't really have a defense at this point. Um, now you definitely do have a defense if they try and audit you five, six years back and you say, well, look, four or five years ago, there was, there was literally no information on what I should be doing when it comes to paying tax. In fact, you know, many there's governments, still like no information said, on that. There's, it's still like a gray area in most European countries. I, I would argue it's a gray area until 2026 when Mika actually comes out or this DARPA actually comes out. Yeah. Well, I can tell you in Estonia, definitely not. It's not gray. It's black and white. It's 20, you know, you pay the same 20% you pay on everything else. Right. And it's, and it's a terrible because you pay on gains, but you can't write off losses. Let's see, for example, yeah. So, but it's very clear. Like, there's no, there's no real question about it. I would say Germany's pretty clear on their tax. You know, as far as I've seen, yeah. UK is fairly clear. France is very clear. Yes, there are going to be smaller countries in the EU 
that haven't that haven't put enough effort into making this clear because they they probably didn't think that they were going to see a major amount of influx of of, of taxes paid. But as they start to see this market grow, yeah, large, get large, into it. I guarantee you they're going to be interested in taxing it. So, um, you know, and then you have, you know, candidates in the U.S. talking about, you know, taxing unrealized gains. Right. So, uh, yeah, that, that's crazy. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's I don't you know, think you know, are... the, the interesting thing there for me is that, you know, anybody that knows anything about U.S. history. So the Revolutionary War was fought over a 2% tax yeah. on tea. Not, not, on, not on income, not on your wealth, not on your pre-wealth. Tea. tea. So instead of having to pay, you know, I don't know, 10 cents for a tea bag, it was 10.002 cents or whatever. Um, and they went to war and died for a two cent tax on tea. And now US is probably, is one of the worst countries in the world when it comes to their tax code and nobody bats an eye. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 a lot of this regulation that's coming, it's gonna affect, I think, Europe negatively, in 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 uh, correlation to other countries. I mean, we saw it with um, with AI, with a new iPhone, where everybody has AI features on the iPhone except Europe right now. So yeah. me right now, I have an iPhone 15. I was so I was excited to get the iOS the 16 so I can practice AI. But guess what? There's no point because the, I can't use it. Yeah, well, that's DARPA. That's exactly that's DARPA. what you just talked about. That's DARPA. So I think that I think really it's the it's the confusion about DARPA and not wanting to step over a line that hasn't quite yet been etched in the sand. Yeah. So so I I my I, I believe more than likely the next iPhone release, you will probably see the AI features in Europe or maybe even before that. But right now, because Apple just paid a ton of money for all yeah. different lawsuits around Europe, they don't want to pay a couple more billion for no reason, and so I think they're just they're just sheepish. You know, they don't want to they don't want to delve uh, down that road again. But I, I I think that'll change. I think it's just confusion about because DARPA is still not well, like most laws, right? It's it's not very clear yet right. on on many things. And we might even see changes in the laws in crypto and stuff over time as well. Oh, for sure. I've never seen in Europe or elsewhere where there is a draft and then a final draft and then a date to go live that it doesn't change quite extensively because especially once it goes live, because unfortunately, you know, most of the time that, that governments go through these these processes to create laws, legislative bodies, uh, they don't necessarily talk to people who are in the industry or or in the business that they're trying to regulate. And when they do, they talk to a very small circle of people. And so when it goes into practice, it's completely different to what they envisioned. Um, and then all the loopholes happen because they didn't think about this edge case, this edge case, that edge case. You know, it's like when you build anything, when it comes to tech, you build something, you don't you know, oh, what about that one guy who instead of clicking on the button is gonna click over here and then go back to to you know two tabs and then click on this button, which which causes this error to happen. Right. You know, you right, know right. nobody predicts those things until they happen, and that's basically what happens with what as laws as laws are launched, especially in a in a region as complicated as Europe, because you're launching one directive, one law, for twenty six different countries. Exactly. Right. Kevin, thank you so much, man. Always a pleasure. Check out the links in the description down below for Coin Metro, one of the best exchanges in Europe. Kevin, thank you. I look forward to seeing you again in our next show. Same, Paul. Same. Cheers. Thanks. All right. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you got a lot of alpha. Now, if you're still sticking around, please check out the Factor Fam, which is linked in the description down below. It's not your typical newspaper. There's so much going on there. Make sure you click the link so you can find out more and make sure you watch this video right here next. Seriously, you don't want to miss this video. If you miss this, don't blame me. Make sure you watch it and I'll see you there.